Hey guys, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell to be updated every time I make a new video. Thanks, let's begin. Well, this book turned 50 in February of this year. Now, let's celebrate it on the 4th of July, the holiday the movie took place around. This is the 1974 novel by Peter Benchley. This is actually an original edition, I believe. It is from 1974, I'm pretty sure. Let me see, because I found it at a Goodwill. I was like, oh my god! Yep, yeah, this is 1974 copyright. An original version. Pretty solid quality, too, overall, if I say so myself. This is a creature feature that is a true, trashy, B-grade novel that was pretty commonplace around this time in the mid-70s, and that lasted up until, well, it's still going on. Before we dive into the review, I just wanted to talk about my book, Stripes. Basically, it's what the Jaws novel could have been if it had more shark action and carnage and a drug subplot that actually affected the shark and everything around it, instead of just being like, oh yeah, there's a, there's a mafia subplot. Yeah, there's still a Mafia subplot. Still. Check it out. It also happens to take place on the 4th of July for the most part. So, there's that. Happy 4th of July! I'll leave links to it in the description and the comment section below. And now, let's get into the review. The plot. Amity is a town under pressure. The townsfolk are generally not very friendly. People seem to be dissatisfied with how their own lives turned out, and corruption surrounds their home. When the sudden appearance of a massive shark starts attacking citizens and making headlines, a lot of pressure is put onto the chief of police. Now it's up to him, a local captain of a fishing boat and an ichthyologist, I think that's how you say it, to stop the man-eaters off their shores. Peach eventually went under a bunch of different names for this book. His name such as Great White. What's that gnashing at my leg? The latter of which was suggested to him by his father, Nathaniel. But Jaws. It's what stuck. It bites your attention. For the characters, we have Martin Brody. He is somewhat of a distant man. He doesn't fully appreciate his wife or his life. Still, he does what needs to be done. There is some remorse when people get eaten by the shark, and he feels a small amount of pressure and a lot of grief, but it's not enough to make you sympathize with him. He's got a short temper. Matt Hooper is the ichthyologist. I'm not sure if that's how you say it. I know how you say Matt Hooper. Not sure if I'm saying ichthyologist right. He is called to the island to figure out what to do. He's an expert in wildlife and how to mess around with Brody's wife. I'm serious. <laughs> Yeah, he and Dylan have this subplot where they hook up. It's a very controversial scene, and it divides fans somewhat. Not from each other, but from opinions on this book. I used to hate this idea. I still do. However, I can kind of see Ellen's side of things. This is not right what she did, because what she did was horribly wrong. She just fell victim to boredom and Hooper's charm. Skeezy bastard. Quint the bald bastard is downright despicable in this book. He's not a hundred percent like Ahab, but there are some similarities. He does not have this prior vendetta against the shark, but he does become obsessed with trying to eliminate it and even has a similar fate to the captain in Moby Dick. Larry Vaughn is a corrupt Man. He has shady dealings with the Mafia, and tries to keep the beaches open for them, and his own well-being. It's not like in the film where he sees dollar signs for the 4th of July. He's in deep doo-doo here. Henry Meadows is a reporter who is on Brody's side for the most part. He wants 
things to work out for everyone, really. He knows his rights from wrongs. He's also a big guy, always described as having big lunches. Shut up. Hendrix is a reliable deputy. He served in Vietnam. That's pretty much all I know about his character. Part one of this three-part novel is probably the best out of all of them. The shark attacks are not crazy, but they are visceral, and they do ring a bit of a familiar vibe to 12 Days of Terror, which is what happened during 1916, I believe, in New Jersey. Those great white attacking all those people. It's either a real or a bull shark or multiple sharks, anyway. True story. Scary stuff. Kind of get that vibe with this. The shark attacks Alex Kittner, and then attack someone else. Not in the same scene, but further down the beach. It's that unsuspecting, horrible terror that this thing is just attacking people. It doesn't care. It doesn't know right from wrong. It's just hungry. By the end of part one, the shark leaves four people dead. Two people on page, two people off page. Part two is where things get sleazy. There's Ellen and Hooper's affair. Yuck. Which goes on for way too long. They discuss fantasy right and such. I don't need to imagine what Hooper's oh face looked like. That's not my oh face. Shut the fuck up. There are certain descriptions in this book that are used a bit too much. Things such as what Brody is eating for lunch and dinner. I'm sorry, but... I don't need to know 65% of his meals, nor did I need to know that most of them consisted of gin and tonic and a sandwich. I got uh, red and white, I didn't know what you'd be serving. Part 3 is adventurous, sure. However, you're following mostly unlikable characters. Brody has the uh, sneaking suspicion that Hooper slept with his wife. You don't say. So there's that tension. There's also the tension that Hooper and Quint don't see eye to eye. I mean, one's a fisherman, one's a marine biologist of sorts. Of course, they ain't gonna see eye to eye. Brody is constantly asking Quint about fishing questions. S stuff even I knew, and I'm not that great of a fisherman. It's made Brody seem unknowledgeable and in a way too over his head. So much so that even you consider the fact that maybe he shouldn't be out there. Not to mention he's not brave, he's not heroic, and by the end, He's just one lucky SOB. I've never seen a boat in my life. Son of a bitch! I get that he's doing it for revenge and retribution, but he needs to know his limitations. In fact, no one in this book is a hero, or, like I said, likable. I've already touched upon Brody's character, but Hooper and Quint, they know their shit. The fact that the shark has them gasping in horror at how different it is, is a bit dumb, because in the movie the shark did a whole bunch of stuff, and then they were like, yeah, this isn't normal. This shark does one or two things, and they're like, oh my god, somebody call the shark exorcist! Two-thirds of the climax, Quint knows he can catch and kill the shark, but then when it starts to become unbelievably unlike a shark, he begins to lose his sanity because he doesn't know if he can do this. That drives him over the edge. You ever have one do this before? I don't know. There needed to be more time on the boat, I feel. We should have gotten more about how these characters think and prepare. Not who they can sleep with or how they can catch sharks. Hell, they go back to shore both nights on the hunt. I didn't feel the isolation at all. They could just go back whenever. Brody's willing, yet risk-taking. Cooper's a snotty, know-it-all, rich, young man. And Quint is a salty sea bastard. Quint is so despicable in the book that he cuts up an unborn dolphin to use as bait. I mean, I th if I remember correctly, he killed it. Like, he killed its mother or something. I might be wrong. Um, I hope I am. Because, like, what the hell? Is that chum line going, Chief? Cooper is just an asshole. I mean, he constantly hints at the idea that he slept with Brody's wife to Brody, while Brody just let his anger simmer and boil until he just explodes on Hooper and starts to get physical. The man knows what he did and seemingly wants Brody to get physical. He relishes in the idea to have this opportunity to mess with Brody. This, because there's no just cause, is a dick move. I mean, Ellen Brody doesn't want anything more than just to relive the old days. She constantly says she doesn't really have feelings for Hooper. By the end of the book, I didn't care. 
there's just something more to her, and it makes it seem likely that she is liable to do something like this again. Like I said, Larry Vaughn has dealings with the Mafia. Brody suspects this and has Harry Meadows dig into his files. By the end, Larry has given up. He plans to flee Amity with his wife. That's what I'm getting at. None of the main players are likable in the least. They all have shady backgrounds or partake in horrible shit. Harry Meadows is like the only somewhat tolerable character and eventually made him a pig. He does not want to harm anyone intentionally. He only wants what's best for the town and its citizens. By the end, he does write an article, which puts Brody in a better light, which is one of the only touching scenes in the book, besides when Hooper touched Ellen's wife. You can tell Benchley loved sharks. Even when reading this novel, it becomes abundantly clear that he wrote this because he wanted to write a horror story with a beautiful creature. It's a beautiful beast that when Hooper reaches out of the cage in that one scene to touch it, it makes it all the more understandable. As the shark glides by, you feel it. It's a scene that could have been added to the movie, but I feel it would have taken away from the tension of the scene. Think of it as respect to Bruce, who did not respect the filmmakers. Never working, but always needed. Much like a shark, always hunted, always studied and always need it, eventually. After writing a slew of horror adventure novels like Beast and White Shark, sought to write his wrongs and decided to be an advocate for shark safety, and tried to help people understand their situation. Well, that didn't stop places I've actually visited to, where they put the Jaws poster on a display and be like, hey, this movie put sharks in a bed of light. But there's never any mention eventually, doing the right thing after. Mm -mm. He aimed to undo all he did against sharks, which he was heavily involved with, unknowingly, at the time. For the gore, there's a body count of six. It consists of people being bit on in bloody fashion. There are only three on-page deaths. One is inadvertently killed. There are some genuinely haunting scenes, like when Chrissy Watkins feels for her leg and it's not there, and when one of our main players is dangling out of the shark's mouth, and while the shark's being shot at, the guy is shot in the neck. Those scenes really amp up the book's intensity. Overall, I remember reading this in a triple book set. I even showed it in my first review for this book, but I sold it. Don't know why. i just kidding, it's right here. I remember reading this triple book set and featured Jaws, Beast, and The Girl of the Sea of Cortez. A beautiful hardcover book. I read this in high school while they were reading something else. I was like, yeah, well, um, whatever. I am reading Jaws. <laughs> I have read this book at least four times, and each time I find wholly different problems with it. At first, I thought it was okay. It had its problems and was missing the magic of the movie, but it had a good carnage. By the third read, I started seeing the problems. And by this read, I've pretty much gotten them down pat. Jaws by Peter Benchley is not high-class art, nor was it meant to be made into a movie of high-class art. It's a trashy novel that's managed to get lucky with its successor. Readers of this book in the 70s were likely surprised with how the movie turned out. This book is still very much a product of its time, but I think it could do much worse. This is one of the rare cases where the book is worse than the film. Overall, I give... Jaws a 2 out of 5. Now, if it was the movie, that'd be quite a different rating. That's going to do for this video, guys. You've been watching Shark House Entertainment, and I am your host, Brian Gatto. Make sure to like, comment on, as well as share this video. Like my Facebook fan page and story on Patreon. Also, check my book, Stripes. The link to it is in the description below. It's about a tiger shark attacking people on the 4th of July. Also, hit that notification bell to be notified every time I make a new video, and there's a... Subscribe! Blah blah.